Hey, thank you, Jose. Um, before I get started, um, let me also express my thanks to Dory for hosting the meeting, to Smokey and Stephanie again for the idea and for coming through with support, and to Jose for inviting me to be part of the uh, um, scientific advisory group and for inviting me to give a talk here. Um, I'm excited to be here in Sanibel again. The last time I was here was in 2004 for the AMS meeting. Um, it's great to be back. Um, so thank you to all of you. OK. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is two studies that I did, or I was involved in, in collaboration with three people from the um, Museum National d'Histoire Naturelle in Paris, the, the National Natural History Museum of France. Um, these people are Claire Regnier, uh, Benoit Fontaine, and Philippe Boucher, um, looking, looking kind of crazily at an apple snail. <laughs> Our collaborators on this project, on these two projects, were um, these two guys who are mathematical modeling wizards from the University of Pierre-Marie Curie in Paris, Guillaume Machaz and Amaury Lambert, um, Carl Christensen, Daniel Chung, and now Noreen Young from the Bishop Museum in Honolulu. Uh, Noreen recently took over as the curator of the Bishop Museum after a 14-year hiatus with no curator after I left. Um, so. That's fantastic to have a curator back in the, in the Bishop Museum. Um, and Noreen's already doing a fabulous job. Um, and last but not least by any means, Ken Hayes, who is my former graduate student, um, now an assistant professor at Howard University, um, and an old friend. So um, let's get started. I'm going to take you back to 2004 when Chuck Lydiard, who's right there, and I, in collaboration with Winston Ponder and um, a whole bunch of other people who were members or are members of the IUCN Mollusk Specialist Group. The IUCN, um, I'm sure most of you know, is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and it is the premier conservation organization globally. And in fact, they're, they have a Congress every four years, and this year in um, August it's going to take place in, in Hawaii, and we're expecting, we're expecting about 8,000 attendees. Um, so what um, Chuck um, and the rest of us did in 2004 was to try to highlight the, the, the conservation problems that mollusks in general have. And our sort of starting point was these data exhibited in this pie chart, which are data from the IUCN red list of threatened species. And what this shows is the number of extinctions in these various major groups of animals. And you will see that this part of the pie here is the mollusks. It's by far the biggest section of the pie compared to any other major group of animals. And in fact, it's around about the same number of extinct species as all of vertebrates put together, as recorded by the IUCN red list. Now, I want to look at, look at the IUCN red list in a little bit more detail. This, this chart takes us back to 1983. The red list was initiated in 1964, but mollusks were not included in it until 1983. And the way it works is that um, specialists evaluate a species, species by species. They evaluate whatever the chosen group is. And so it takes a long time for a, a major group to be completely evaluated. And so to start with, there were just a few species that had been evaluated, and very few of those had been recorded as extinct. Gradually, that number increased as more species were evaluated. Then there was this sudden leap of 
records of ex extinct mollusks. And this is a result of increasing awareness in the late 1980s of the catastrophic extinction of partulid tree snails in the Society Islands of French Polynesia. And this is one of them. This is a, a partulid tree snail from the island of Morea, which is the next door island to Tahiti. Um, and people became a, very much aware of this because there had been the introduction of a carnivorous snail species to, in attempts to control a previous introduction of a snail called the, the giant African snail, which of course is now uh, been in, reintroduced to Florida and is causing major problems around um, in the Miami area. Um, so people became very much aware of this as a, as a major problem that land snails were, were facing. And so there was a push to try and evaluate more species by the IUCN. And that resulted in this leap in the recorded number of mollusk extinctions around about that time. So this, this is the... Um, 1992 edition of the Red List. Um, you'll see that it's kind of odd that the number of extinctions went down. I mean, once you're extinct, you're extinct. You can't come back. Um, but in fact, that little, little um, downturn is because in 1996, in the 1996 Red List, people had realized that a number of species that had gone extinct, that had been recorded as extinct, I should say, were actually still extant. They'd been found found to be still around. The other reason that it's gone down is because a number of species that were considered to be extinct were then realized or evaluated as being synonyms of species that were all, in fact still extant. So that number came down a little bit. And so, but since 1996, which is when the last hard copy edition of the Red List was produced, it's all, it was all online since then. Um, and there have been various editions right up to the latest edition, the, the fourth version of 2015, which is the current red list, when we have 310 mollusk species listed as extinct. Okay. So let me step back a little and talk about all species, not just mollusks. There's a sort of consensus sort of beginning to form that there are about 1.9 million known, that is described, species on Earth. Of, that's not including microorganisms. This is eukaryote organisms. Of those 1.9 million, 834 are currently listed as having gone extinct by the IUCN Red List. And we're talking about extinctions, or the Red List talks about extinctions from about the year 1600 um, so they're not interested in the dinosaurs or, or extinct ammonites or whatever. Um, so 834 species is 0.04% of this 1.9 million species. So a tiny, tiny fraction of overall biodiversity has gone extinct since the year 1600. And 834 species in 416 years is almost exactly two species going extinct per year. This translates into 1.1 species per million species per year. And this is the metric that a lot of the extinction people use. Extinctions per million species years. So 1.1 species per million species per year. Now, how significant is that, is that figure of 1.1 million? Well, people have tried to assess the background rate of extinctions. And it turns out that the background rate, depending on how you assess it, ranges from 0.1 to 1, roughly, extinctions per million species years. Now, that range is not a huge lot different from 1.1 species per million species per year. So the question then is, well, is there really a biodiversity crisis? Well, the extinction rate is no different from the background rate. So environmental skeptics, the people who don't want to acknowledge that we have a biodiversity crisis, don't want to acknowledge climate change, want to make loads of money in the short term at the expense of the environment, da-da-da-da-da, 
um, they would say no. They would say, look, the IUCN, the premier organization for conservation globally, tells us that there's really very few extinctions going on, um, no more than background. So these coral reefs are doing just fine. These tropical rainforests are doing just fine. Thank you very much. So shut up, all you conservation biologists. However, the IUCN is not set up to um, evaluate the extinction rate. That's not its purpose. Its explicit purpose is to highlight taxa threatened with extinction and thereby promote their conservation. So their goal is not to assess extinctions. Their goal is to try to focus on species that are in need of conservation effort. Things like these, tigers, condors, humpback whales, black rhinos. Um, and you know, these are the, this is the charismatic megafauna, not the mollusks that no one knows anything about. <laughs> um, so we have to be very careful in using extinction rates as determined from the IUCN Red List data. But let me talk to you a little bit about how the IUCN evaluates species. So all species, obviously all of them have not yet been evaluated. So there's a bunch not evaluated. So can't do anything about those. Of those that have been evaluated, a whole bunch are what the IUCN calls data deficient. That is, there's not enough information available for, us to, for them to make a decision about which category to put that species in um, based on the criteria set up by the IUCN in this 30-page booklet, IUCN Red List Categories and Criteria. Those criteria are very detailed, require a lot of information, and for many species, that's not available. For those were, that have adequate data, they're categorized into this range of, ca of categories each of which has increasing risk of extinction all the way through to those that are actually extinct. So least concern, near threatened, they're not so concerned about those because the, their focus is on doing something to try and conserve those species that are in need. Their focus is on these, what they call the threatened categories of vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered. Now, when you evaluate a species, Inevitably, you're going to find some that are extinct. And so they, in, they list those as extinct. Oh, sorry. Or maybe extinct in the wild. That is, there's only, the species is only present in captivity now. So listing things as extinct by the IUCN is essentially a byproduct of focusing on these threatened species. And that's very important. So is the IUCN Red List an appropriate, appropriate vehicle for assessing overall biodiversity extinction rates or extinction rates of our um, area of interest, mollusks? Well, as I said, all species have not been evaluated. However, most mammal and, mammals and birds have indeed been evaluated. There are about 16,000 species of mammals and birds. Of those, 851, that's about 5%, are listed as data deficient. So most mammals and birds, we have significant, sufficient knowledge about them in order to be able to um, place them in one of those categories, not the data deficient category. Um, there are 20, 225 of them those mammals and birds have been categorized as extinct. And that's probably quite accurate because we know everything about most mammals, about everything. We know enough about most mammals and birds to, to categorize them. So, you know, we know that quaggas are extinct. We know that the Tasmanian wolf is extinct. We know that the dodo has gone extinct. I mean, this is the quintessential extinct species. But what about the rest? what Winston Ponder called the other 99%, which is basically all the invertebrates. Only a tiny fraction of invertebrates have been 
evaluated. And the question is why? Well, I think most of us know the answer why, but <clears throat> let me just go over them. First of all, many, there are many specialists per mammal and bird species. You know, for every bird or mammal species, there's a bunch of people working on tigers or elephants or whatever it might be. Um, and they're mostly ecologists because, in a sense, we don't need taxonomists for these species anymore because that's all been done. We know what species are out there. We know, I mean, I'm speaking very broadly here. Um, most of these people are ecologists. They're out in the field. They're generating the kinds of data that the IUCN needs in order to evaluate a species. That is, things like um, contractions of range, uh, numbers of individuals still left. Can you imagine trying to, say, trying to figure out the number of individual um, Acatinella species that are actually left? It's impossible for a mollusk, a small land snail, to say, there's 57 of them left. <laughs> um, but for these big, big charismatic animals, we can say things like there are 30 white rhinos left or whatever it might be uh, because there are a lot of people out there counting them, thinking about them, doing research on them. On the other hand, invertebrate specialists, for the most part, deal with hundreds of species each. I mean, Ken and Nori sitting down there working on Hawaiian land snails, they've got 750 known species, never mind the ones that haven't been described yet, to work on. So per person, that's if you just count the two of them, and there are some others working on them, they're working on 300 species each. And for the most part, people working on invertebrates are taxonomists rather than ecologists, animal behaviorists, because it's the taxonomists who are doing the biodiversity surveys, counting the numbers of species, determining which species are which, and so on and so forth. So this is the first problem. It's a bias in favor of the, vert the charismatic vertebrates. And this is exemplified by the number of what we call specialist groups within the IUCN. So vertebrates have a total of 73 specialist groups. 35 of those are for mammals alone. And many of those 35 deal with just one or a few species, at most a family. So for instance, one of the uh, mammal groups is for canidae, dogs. Um, in contrast, for invertebrates, there are only 12 for the, for the other 99%, that is. Um, and one of, the, one of those for mollusks, the mollusk specialist group, for a whole phylum. So is it any wonder that we know so much less about mollusks than we do about dogs, for instance. Dogs being wolves, coyotes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it turns out that there are roughly an equal number of specialists working on vertebrates as there are working on plants and there is, as there are working on invertebrates. But Plants are 10 times more, there are 10 times more species of plants than um, vertebrates, and there's 100 times more invertebrates than there are vertebrates, roughly speaking. So those specialists have their work cut out. And this just exemplifies that, or illustrates that um, visually. For every, say, 10 species, there's one, just for the sake of argument, there's one invertebrate specialists. For every 10 species, there's 10 plant specialists. That's one each. For every 10 vertebrate species, there's 100 people. So there's 10, 10 people working on each individual animal species. I'm dwelling on this point just to make the point very strongly that invertebrates are poorly represented in terms of the number of specialists working on them. And this plays into how, how we evaluate extinction. The other, the other problem with the IUCN red list in terms of um, evaluating extinction is that, as I mentioned, the kinds of data that are required to um, evaluate a species 
based on the IUCN categories and criteria are the kinds of data that are, for invertebrates, extremely difficult to obtain. Things like, as I said, the numbers of individuals still left, range contractions, um, so on and so forth. Um, so many invertebrate species, even if they get to be evaluated, are evaluated as data deficient. So coming back to mollusks, there are 70 plus thousand species of known mollusks, according to the most recent assessment by Gary Rosenberg. Um, of those, about 10% have been assessed by the IUCN Red List. And of those 7,000 or so, almost 2,000, in fact, 28% of them are data deficient, which contrasts hugely with the 5% that I mentioned of mammals that have, that have been evaluated as data deficient. So there's a big problem here in terms of using the IUCN Red List for evaluating the level of extinction among mollusks. So we need an alternative way of, of doing that if we want to get a real handle on how many mollusks have actually gone extinct. And so back in 2009, Claire and Benoit and Philippe published this paper in Conservation Biology, not knowing, not recording, not listing, numerous unnoticed mollusk extinctions. So in, 1990, in 2009, they were using data from the 2007 version of the IUCN Red List, on which 850 species were listed as extinct. 302 of those were mollusks. So what Claire did was to review those IUCN listed mollusks, scan the literature, and consulted experts um, on those um, species and on the species that those experts um, were experts on. What she found that instead of 302 mollusk species um, extinct on the red list, in fact, only 269 should actually be considered extinct for the reasons that I mentioned before, that some, some of these 302 were um, previously evaluated as extinct but had been found extant, and because some had been synonymized with extant species. So 269 already listed on the red list. But what she also found was that in the literature, another 249 had been determined to be extinct but hadn't yet made it onto the red list. And then there were 14 species that were neither recorded by the red list nor in the literature. And so what she essentially did was double the number of species that should be listed as extinct compared to what the IUCN had listed as extinct. So... The problem was, with that paper, that it was focused only on the species that those specialists happened to know about. It did not deal with the whole 76,000 species of mollusks that maybe no one really was focusing or doing research on. And so what Claire then decided to do, along with um, Philippe and um, the rest of the collaboration, um, was to generate a random sample of land snails globally. She, she, she took 200 land snail species. This was a very, very rigorous randomization um, that she undertook. Um, the idea being that it would then produce an unbiased assessment of the level of mollusk extinction globally. Um, I'm sorry, land snail extinction. It's focused on land snails. Um, and this just shows you the, the global extent of uh, the, the sample of 200 species that she um, obtained. First of all, she evaluated them based on the IUCN categories and criteria using a literature search and um, evaluating um, a number of museum collections. She went through the collections of the um, Natural History Museum in Paris uh, looking at label data, uh, catalog ledger data, um, archive materials, and so on. And then she went to the online databases of the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, which is here, the Field Museum in Chicago, um, the Museum of Comparative Zoology in Harvard, and the U.S. National Museum. She then approached a whole slew of experts to see what their opinion was 
of um, species they knew about. And these are just a, a selection of the many people that she approached, approached. These are the people that I happen to have photographs. That's the only reason they're there. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so what did she find? Oh, before I get onto that. <clears throat> she, she also, or well, between us all, we got in touch with Guillaume and Amory and asked them to develop independently, but based on those 200 species, a probabilistic model of the chance that a species was extinct. Actually, a chance that the species was extant. Um, this is an independent, the idea was to produce an independent corroboration of the expert analysis that Claire had done. And I can't explain this to you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, what did she find out? Well, first of all, she found that the, the probabilistic model did pretty much corroborate the expert analysis. And so I'm not going to say any more about that. <laughs> you, you'll be, so, I, I guess that's thankful laughing there. Um, okay. <clears throat> so what she found was that of those 200 species, only 31 could be evaluated because they had sufficient data based on the IUCN criteria. And of those, three were, were categorized as extinct. So three out of 200. The experts, however, were able to figure they had enough data to categorize 118 of the 200 species. And they categorized 20 as extinct. So that's 20 species categorized as extinct by the experts compared to three based on the IUCN criteria. The reason that these... I made this the, the categories sort of comparable here just for the purposes of this presentation, but they're not exactly comparable. The categories in this for the experts were not threatened and threatened and extinct. So it's kind of simplified um, categorization compared to the IUCN categories of, uh, that I went, went, went through before. Um, okay, so is there a crisis? Well, the title of this paper that we published in 2015 kind of gives the game away. Um, so we have we estimated 20 out of 200 landsnail species were extinct. That's 10% of that sample, that random sample. So there are approximately 30,000 non-marine uh, species of mollusks. So this tells us that 10% of 3,000, or 30,000, 3,000 non-marine mollusk species have gone extinct. Not the 310 that are currently on the IUCN red list. Not the 450 that we could extrapolate from our IUCN criteria-based evaluation. And not even the 532 that Claire estimated in the 2009 paper. And many of these have gone extinct before they were even discovered and described scientifically. For instance, this radiation of helicinid snails in the Gambia Islands, here they are, four of the ten. Um, this was published in 2013 by Ira Richling and Philippe Boucher. Um, and, well, I'll, I'll mention that a little bit later on in passing. So, we've got vast extinctions of mollusks compared to what the IUCN red list will tell us. And I'm just going to go through briefly the, the main causes of extinction of these non-marine snails. And, most of you are aware of this kind of thing, um, I'm sure, but just let me um, briefly summarize. So, what are the causes of these extinctions? The first thing is obviously habitat destruction. And these are some examples. Here's that radiation of helicinids in the Gambia Islands. Um, of the 10 species, nine are extinct, and they've gone extinct essentially because this formerly forested habitat has disappeared, it's been deforested, initially by the Polynesians who colonized these islands, but much more dramatically once Europeans arrived in these islands. There are no snails on the, no native snails in this grassland. Another example was of a species that was first recorded as extinct earlier this year in Romania, 
this species, Melanopsis paraceae, is a narrowly endemic species that once occurred in these very specific thermal spring-fed ponds and lakes in Romania. In recent years, there's been an upsurge of tourism to this, um, this area of Romania, uh, people wanting to take advantage of the properties of the, of the thermal water. And so there's been over-exploitation of that water, and these lakes and ponds have declined to the extent that there's now only this tiny little remnant left. And recent surveys in this pond could not find any of these uh, of individuals with this species, and the species was declared extinct. So destruction of the habitat, uh, the thermal spring-fed habitat, this example, this is not an extinct species yet, Howellifanta augusta, but it's on its way, for sure. Um, this was first described in 2008. It was discovered in Mount Augusta in New Zealand, and this, uh, this mountain was slated to be um, destroyed for open-cast coal mining. Um, the coal mining operation was supposed to um, mediate this rem uh, by... Um, setting aside an area of land to which a bunch of the snails could be transferred. And in fact, that happened, but those, it's a, sort of supposed to be the same kind of habitat. But obviously, there's something a little bit different because they're not doing at all well in that new habitat. They also brought some of the individuals into captivity, but unfortunately, there was an electrical fault in the, over the weekend one, one day, one weekend, and... Most of them died in the, in the environmental changes. So this species is probably is going to go extinct as a result of <coughs> this open cast mining. Of course, I mentioned the extinction of tree snails in the Society Islands. And this is just to reiterate it. Um, this is one of the... Uh, only clear-cut examples of species going extinct as a result of the impact of introduced species. It's actually very difficult to say introduced species are the cause of extinction as opposed to being one of numerous causes um, playing out in concert to cause the extinction of a species. So these are tree snails of um, the Society Islands. Acatina fulica was introduced in the, um, probably in the 1960s and became extremely abundant and widespread. And so people decided to introduce Euglandina rosea, the predatory snail from Florida. Um, and they did this at the um, recommendation of the, of the Hawaii Department of Agriculture, who had already introduced it into Hawaii, where it had run rampant. Um, not controlling the African snail, but doing a real good number on the native snails um, for reasons that I can talk about later, or maybe Ken will talk about later. Um, but nonetheless, they wanted to do something about the African snail, so they went ahead and introduced Euglandina rosea. And of course, it wiped out a whole bunch of these native um, partially tree snails. And we know this because there were scientists actually doing work on the island of Morea in particular and on the tree snails. And when they realized that the um, predatory snail had been introduced, they did survey work and showed that as, the, as, the, as Euglandina spread a way, like a wave across the island of Morea, the tree snails were left extinct in its wake. So this was the, one of the clearest examples of the impacts of introduced, species, of introduced species causing the extinction of a of molluscs species. Now, this is a bit more difficult. Uh, and I mentioned that it's difficult to, to be sure that introduced species are absolutely the cause of um, the extinction of um, another species. So back in 1998, this paper was published, Impending Extinction of North American Freshwater Mussels 
because of the introduction of uh, zebra mussels. But then, almost a decade later, this paper was published in which the authors could not find any real evidence that anything had gone extinct as a result of the introduction of zebra mussels. And what they suggested, and Art might have some, some argument with this, I'm not sure, um, but what they suggested was that the native mussels had sort of, they declined for sure, but they were existing at a sort of steady state in low numbers, and that perhaps there was an equilibrium being generated between the mussels and the native mussels and the zebra mussels. So in this case, it turned out that perhaps the zebra mussels had not caused or, were, or are not causing the ultimate extinction, but they have had an impact, not necessarily going as far as we think. The next cause of extinction one might think of is exploitation of a species for human consumption, for instance. Um, this is, this is your, your regular French escargot. And it's listed by the IUCN as of least concern, which means they, they're not worried about it. But there are people in Europe saying, oh, we can't find them anymore. What's going to happen to our escargot? Um, and uh, so there's this possibility that those, that species has at least declined, although it's not going extinct. And again, it's difficult to find an example in which exploitation or indeed shell collecting has resulted in the extinction, if not the, um, I mean, the extinction of a species rather than just um, implementing its decline. Um, this is a picture of pictures from the Bishop Museum. And back in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, um, there was a sort of craze to collect tree snails. And in particular, of the subfamily Acatinoene. Now, these are the very brightly colored, pretty, very collectible tree snails. And there are archive records in the Bishop Museum that say uh, they, mo they were mostly teenage boys who would go and collect these things, and they'd, they'd exchange them. You know, I've got a green one. I have got a yellow one. I want, you know. Um, and there's one particular quote that, that I'll never forget. It says, we, we rode on horseback, some, something like this, we rode on horseback up into Manoa Valley, which is where the University of Hawaii now is, and we collected tree snails without getting off our horses. Uh, they were hanging like grapes from the, from, like bunches of grapes from the trees. And we collected 2,000 this afternoon and put them in our saddlebags. Um, and they would do that weekend after weekend. So the only good thing about this is that when those guys passed on, um, some of them had actually made really extensive field notes. Um, and so their collections were extremely valuable from a research perspective. And they now reside in these cabinets in the Bishop Museum. And there's a whole bank of cabinets just full of Agatinoa tree snails. Not necessarily collected by the Bishop Museum curators, but by these hobbyists whose collections ultimately ended up in the, in the Bishop Museum. But again, and these have, it's been suggested that this, has had, this had an impact on the extinction of the tree snails, but it's not clear that it's the only thing because there's habitat destruction, introduction of, introduction of euglandina, rats, a whole plethora, plethora of different kinds of impacts that have resulted in the extinction of, of these species. Um, so again, it's difficult to say that this is the one and only cause. Okay, next and the last cause of extinction that I'm going to uh, briefly talk about. Um, Climate change. Now, this species is a species from the island of Aldabra in the Indian Ocean, and it was um, thought to be extinct in this paper published in 2013. Turns out that it's not extinct. Some individuals were actually found alive subsequent to that paper. Um, however, it has declined hugely, and it's thought to have declined as a result of decreasing rainfall. So climate change. Um, and, you know, it's quite possible that it will go extinct as the climate changes further because there's not many of them left. Um, this is the only 
almost example that I could find of a species that's actually gone extinct as a result of climate change, and it actually hasn't gone extinct. But this is another example to show the, at least the impacts of climate on um, land snails. This is a, a Western European species that is widespread and abundant throughout Western Europe, Arianta arbustorum. Um, and this paper was published in 1993, which showed that this species had gone locally extinct around the city, the Swiss, Swiss city of Basel, um, as a result, they postulated, of the warming of the climate as a result of the expanding of that city. So in the surroundings of Basel, this species could no longer be found, possibly because of climate change. So no clear examples. But I want to talk a little bit about oceanic islands and climate change. This is a sort of very, very simplified diagram of, say, the Hawaiian Islands. Um, you've got coastal and lowland habitat that now has already mostly been transformed by the introduction of invasive plants, urbanization, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are species, and, and a whole bunch of species have gone extinct as a result of that. But there are still species, native species, that are mostly now the species that were adapted to the montane parts of the islands. Obviously, with climate change, this is going to happen. The temperatures are going to get warmer. The montane habitat is going to disappear because it's now too hot, and the snails are, have nowhere to go, so they're going to go extinct. So that's a very simplified idea, but I, I think that it's very likely that that's going to happen within the next however long. Um, so oceanic islands, I want to move on to oceanic islands a little bit. Um, this was a, a chart from Claire et al's paper back in 2009, the not knowing, not whatever paper. Um, and it shows that most mollusk extinctions are actually extinctions of oceanic island species. I've outlined in red those geographic areas which are entirely oceanic islands, and in um, dashed lines, the, those that have at least some oceanic islands. And it's clear that the vast majority, and in fact, 71% of those mollusk extinctions in that paper were from oceanic islands. So oceanic island mollusks are extremely susceptible to extinction. So now I'm going to move on to the second a collaborative study with the people in Paris. Um, the idea for this was um, came about through discussions between Claire Renier, Philippe Boucher, and myself at the Paris Museum. And we decided that um, we would focus on the family Amastridae. Uh, the Amastrids are an endemic Hawaiian family, indeed the only extant endemic family of any group of plants or animals in Hawaii. And I'm sure Ken's going to talk about them. Um, more in the next talk. There are 325 known species of amastrids. Spectacular number of species for a, a tiny little archipelago. Um, and this is one of those, this is one of Ken's photographs um, of one of the species that's still extant. Claire spent a lot of time in the Bishop Museum going through the collections, going through the archives. Uh, and this, it, I just want to stress the value of museum collections for this kind of research, and indeed other kinds of research, obviously. But it's crucial to have these museum collections um, that provide a historical record of what was where, when. Okay. So what Claire did was she took two approaches. Again, she decided to do this expert consultation approach in which uh, the um, she compared information that she could get from experts, and in this case, primarily information from field surveys that were undertaken between 2000 and 2015, primarily led by Ken Hayes initially, and subsequently by Noreen Young. Um, and between them and myself initially as well, um, and a whole bunch of people, students and so on, <coughs> 
We've now covered over 800 sites across the Hawaiian Islands sampling snails. Um, there are other people, and so there's a huge, huge bunch of data that was available to compare the modern distributions of these species with historical distributions as um, obtainable from the museum record. Claire also discussed this with other experts. There are quite a number of people in Hawaii who are interested in land snails both professionally and as um, just hobbyists who like to go hiking and are interested in looking for snails. Um, and so she consulted with as many of those as, as she possibly could and ended up deciding to consider a species as extinct if it had not been found since 2004, that is, since the beginning of these extensive surveys, <coughs> at any survey location at which the species had previously been recorded. Okay. The second approach was, again, a complementary approach that was supposed to corroborate any results from the expert consultation approach. Um, and it's based on the collection years in the in all the collection years, both from the museum records and from the modern surveys. And the analysis, this analysis was done primarily by Claire and by Benoit, um, based on these two approaches by Lee and Thompson et al. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of these, um, but get straight on to the results from this study. What we found was that 131 species had gone extinct. Or we could, we could assess as pretty definitively we think these species are extinct. 179, we had insufficient data in order to be sure that these things had gone extinct. And we had 15 species that we evaluated as extant. So the range of species that, the range of numbers of species that we consider to be extinct are from 131, these that we definitively know to be extinct which is 40% of the 325 species of anastrids, up to 310 if you consider these 179 for which we have, we're not sure, um, but we think they're probably mostly extinct. So these are the extremes, 131 definitely extinct, 310, which is 95% of two, uh, 325, um, probably extinct. The red list has th lists 33 species, that's 10% of the fauna. Here's one of the extant ones, Laminella sanguinea. Um, again, a photograph by Ken. Um, and this is an extinct species in the genus Corellia. This is the largest ever Hawaiian land snail. It's about eight, eight centimeters tall. That's about so big. Fantastic snail. It's probably last seen in the wild in about 1950. I would love to see that crawling around, but sadly, it's never going to happen. The probability analysis corroborated those results, but those species that we considered extinct, the probability of being extant for most of them was less than 0.01%. For a few, it was less than 0.1%, and for a very small number, still low. For those species that we considered extant, we um, the probability of being extant in the future, because obviously if they're extant now, the probability of being extant now is 100%. Um, in the future, we took, we took 200, 2025 as the date, and obviously the probability of being extant in 2025 is much higher than it is for these species we evaluated as extinct. So the point here is that this independent analysis corroborated essentially the results of the expert analysis. This, species, this is one of the species that's still extant. And it's interesting, this shell, because of this hole here. I just wanted to mention this. This hole is there because it was a shell that was used by Polynesians to make a shell necklace, what we call a lei in Hawaii. Um, and this, in fact, the, fir the very first Hawaiian land snails that were described by Western science were from a shell lei donated to 
Captain Dixon, who was the second ship captain who made it to Hawaii after um, Captain Cook. Okay, so why have these amastrids all gone extinct? Well, there are four phases of extinction. Um, we're not going to... Okay. There were species that have, have been described as fossils or subfossils, but we don't know when they went extinct. It could have been before the Polynesians arrived, or it could have been after the Polynesians arrived. So we've treated them as um, species belonging to this phase of extinction, the Polynesian phase. phase. Polynesians arrived in Hawaii about a thousand years ago. Uh, they, they destroyed significant areas of low elevation habitat. This is a taro field. Uh, but they also destroyed significant areas of mid-elevation habitat uh, for their agriculture. And so a number of species, particularly of low and intermediate elevations, went extinct during this period. Prior to the arrival of the Europeans in 1778, here's Captain Cook off the, off the big island of Hawaii. Um, Europeans, of course, introduced a whole slew of ungulate species, goats, sheep, particularly pigs, which had devastated the Hawaiian forest, um, rats. Um, and then the third phase would be the introduction of large-scale agriculture in the late 19th century. So this is a pineapple field. Um, pineapples and sugar were the, the main big agriculture um, uh, operations in Hawaii beginning towards the end of the 19th century. And obviously, there's no native snails in this pineapple field. Um, it just so happens that the uh, global extinction paper that I've already discussed, I didn't mention that around 1895, we saw a sudden increase in, the modeling showed a sudden increase in the rate of extinction of land snails on a global basis. Um, so that coincides with this um, uh, increase in um, major agricultural operations. Then, um, the next phase we, we considered is to be post-Second World War, when there was increased military, tourism, commerce. Uh, this is Waikiki. Um, obviously, there's no native snails in this concrete jungle. Um, and the introduction of a truckload more of invasive species, particularly the introduction of the um, predatory snail that I've talked about already. So this all fed into um, the extinction of amastrids. And this is a complicated chart, and I'm going to work, work through it slowly and carefully to explain it to you. Um, so here are those two possible numbers for the extremes of extinction of amastrid snails. The 131 that we know to be extinct and the 310, if you include those 179 that we think we don't have enough information for, but we think are probably extinct. So 310 and 131 are the two extremes of extinction. Then there are these four extinction phases, starting with the Polynesians in around 1,000 years ago, Captain Cook's arrival in 1778, the introduction of big agriculture in 1895, and post-Second World War, 1945, and this takes us up to the year 2013 when we did this analysis. So if you take this definitive number of extinctions, 131, and say that everything went extinct in a linear fashion, which is obviously not what actually happened, but for the sake of simplicity, a linear fashion, and we ended up with those 131 extinct by the year 2013 then the rate of extinction, number of species going extinct per decade, is 0.4% 0, 0 of the entire fauna of 325 species. At the other extreme, if you go to, if you consider 310 species to have gone extinct by 2013, beginning in the year 1000, then the rate is 1% of that 325 per decade going extinct. At the other extreme, if you consider that all extinctions began after the Second World War, obviously not true, but just to, to provide the extremes, um, and there were 131 extinctions, 
then the rate was 6.1% per decade. If you take it that there were 310 went extinct between 1945 and 2013, then the rate is 14.3%. So the overall rate of extinction, well, so, so to summarize that, 325 species went extinct. Sorry, 131 species to 310 species out of the 325 have gone extinct. And this is a rate of 0.4 to 14.3% going extinct per decade. Now, I forgot to mention that obviously it's not linear. This is a more likely trajectory. This, and we just drew this by hand. It's not a mathematically um, determined curve. Either of these two scenarios are the more likely scenarios with extinction increasing towards the latter years. And so we just sort of thought, well, between these two extremes, perhaps 5% per decade is probably more sort of the most likely sort of number. Um, IUCN only lists 33 species as extinct. So we think that there's 15 left. And in fact, when we did the study, there were 15 left, but Ken and Nori and their crew have found two additional species um, since that time. So there are 17 species, that's right, isn't it, that we know to be extant as we speak out of 325. Now, given the trajectories that I showed you in the previous slide, the prospects for these remaining 17, to be honest, don't seem great. Um, but people are trying to keep them going. People are um, very focused on efforts to keep these things going. So that's, you know, maybe with a bit of luck, we'll manage to keep at least some of them going for a significant length of time. I should say that this, this study was only on the amastrids. So this catastrophic level of extinction um, is only the case for this family and perhaps one or two other families in Hawaii. Other families have suffered, they've suffered a high level of extinction, but perhaps only 50% of the species have gone extinct. And Ken will be talking more about this. Okay, so let's step back again and try and extrapolate this to all invertebrates. All invertebrates means essentially all species because that's 99% of the other 99%. So, We've got 10% of land snails have gone extinct. Approximately a third of all species, not just mollusks, are marine. And marine species have suffered much less extinction, although I'm sure we're going to hear about some threats um, and extinctions tomorrow. For instance, there are only three marine mollusks listed extinct by the ICN. In fact, there's four listed, but one of them is not a marine species. So this is one of those extinct species. It's a, a um, rather nondescript um, limpet. Someone will take me to task for that, I'm sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so we can say that instead of 10% of the snails, 7% because a third of the species are marine and haven't suffered the same level of extinction, 7% of all species have gone extinct since 1600. Not 0.04% as is on the IUCN red list. So this just stresses that using the IUCN red list as a measure of extinction is essentially wrong. Um, I should say, emphasize, that this is a generalized global extinction rate because it was based on that sample of 200 species globally. But what I've shown you is that island Oceanic island species are very much more susceptible to extinction than are many continental species. And this just shows you some of the islands that have been well surveyed. These are some of the islands of the Republic of Palau in the Western Pacific, where a former student of mine has done extensive survey, Rebecca Rundell. Um, and this is more rare in the Society Islands of French Polynesia, which we've talked about already. So by, by taking this number of 7%, and generalizing it to a global, to take this global value of 7% and thinking that that's the rate of extinction on islands is probably going to downplay the conservation needs of those species on islands. 
So it's kind of dangerous to just say, well, there's 7% globally. You have to break it down a bit. So I've been very, you might think I've been very critical of the IUCN, but I have not. I've simply said that one aspect of what they do is inappropriate for assessing um, the level of extinction globally because they haven't evaluated everything by any stretch. And so the numbers of ex species listed as extinct by IUCN are too small to use to make valid judgments about the overall rates of extinction globally. Um, however, the IUCN, that's not the IUCN's focus. The IUCN's focus, as I said right at the beginning of the talk, is to highlight taxa threatened with extinction and thereby promote their conservation. They're not in the business of trying to generate lists of extinct species. Indeed, the status of most mammals and birds, and indeed, increasingly, the amphibians, um, has been, been assessed. And so the IUCN, IUCN data are appropriate for evaluating extinctions in those groups. But a tiny, 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 tiny fraction of invertebrates has been assessed. So I'm not criticizing the IUCN for what they do. The IUCN thinks I am. Uh, they've, they've put these two papers into their category, misunderstood. <laughs> um, anyway, anyway. Um, so is there a biodiversity crisis? We've already lost 10% of non-marine mollusks. Well, you know what the answer is going to be, don't you? Um, probably 7% of all species on Earth. Oceanic island biotas are particularly susceptible. So yes, indeed, there is a biodiversity crisis. The sixth extinction. Sixth mass extinction. Thank you very much.